The Prime Minister. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I first of all join you and the whole House in commending Sammy Woodhouse? It is, I think we all recognise across this House that for too long it has been difficult for rape victims to speak out. I hope that now, following her example, others will recognise that they will be heard and that proper action will be taken. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Mr Philip Dunn. Mr Speaker, could I echo yours and the Prime Minister's comments in respect of uh, Sammy Woodhouse from these back benches? Does my right honourable friend believe that today's announcement of the UK life sciences sector's significant investment uh, to work alongside the NHS using genomics and AI to help diagnose major diseases early shows that world-class life sciences companies such as Agilent in my constituency will continue to invest in the UK to help the NHS improve patient outcomes post-Brexit. Well, the Prime can I, Minister. Can I say to uh, my honourable friend that uh, this investment is indeed a significant one. £1 billion investment. It will deliver a state of the art research and development facility in the UK. It will support 650 jobs. It is absolutely right that this does show the opportunities available to the UK post Brexit. It also shows the advantage of our industrial strategy with AI right at the heart of that and, and recognising the importance of AI in the uh, health sector in the future. This is a, a, a very significant investment. It will support jobs in the UK. It will support other employment in the UK and our economy in the future. Mr Jeremy Corbyn. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And uh, I join yourself and the Prime Minister in welcoming Sammy Woodhouse to Parliament today. And it's a typical act of your generosity to refer to her in the gallery today so that others may be emboldened to deal with the horrors of the rape crisis that we face. Mr Speaker, I'd also like to express our sympathies to the family of Luke Griffin from Merseyside, who was killed in Kabul last week, alongside five fellow G4S workers who were Afghan nationals. Luke had previously served in the 16th Regiment of the Royal Artillery. Mr Speaker, while we debate the critical issue of Brexit, we must not neglect the crisis facing millions of people across our country. Last week, I wrote to the Prime Minister about the scathing report of the UN Special Rapporteur on this government's brutal policies towards the poorest in Britain. As of now, I have received no reply from the Prime Minister. But when the Prime Minister read the report, what shocked her more? Was it the words the UN used, or was it the shocking reality of rising poverty in Britain? Prime Minister. I say to the right honourable gentleman, and we have been clear, as my right honourable friend, Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, has been, that we don't agree with this report because what we actually see. No, we don't agree with this report. What we actually see in our country today is absolute poverty at record lows. More, peop- more people in work than ever before. Youth unemployment almost halved, wages growing, and that's because of the balanced approach that we take to our economy, a Conservative government delivering for the British people. Jeremy Corbyn! Mr Speaker, it could be that she doesn't agree with it because it's an unpalatable truth that's in that report. Yes. The new Work and Pensions Secretary seems to have taken a lesson from her and created a hostile environment for those that are claiming benefits. Yes. One... One of the government's policies that's causing the greatest anxiety and poverty is universal credit. Absolutely. The UN rapporteur, Professor Alston, said it was fast falling into universal discredit. Yeah. When will the Prime Minister demonstrate some of her professed concern about burning injustices and halt the rollout of universal credit? Prime Minister. Uh, can I say to the right honourable gentleman, we've exchanged on this issue of universal credit before. Universal credit. You, oh, the, the, the Shadow Foreign Secretary from a sedentary position says we've not done anything about it. What we have done, as we have been rolling out universal credit, is making changes as we have gone through those changes. But actually, I'm afraid, I'm afraid that what we saw was a Labour Party that wouldn't support the changes we were making to universal credit. 
So we've listened and we've made changes. It's time actually that the Labour Party recognised that the universal credit is ensuring that we see more people in work in this country, that we see absolute poverty at record lows. And that's it, a system that delivers for people, encourages them into work, a simpler system that's better for those people who need to use it. Jeremy Corbyn, uh, she might just care to cast her eyes over the report from the Trussell Trust. And I quote, if the five-week wait isn't reduced, the only way to stop even more people being forced into food banks this winter will be to pause all new claims to universal credit. The UN also called for the five-week wait to be scrapped. In the coming weeks, universal credit is being rolled out in Anglesey, Blackpool, Milton Keynes, parts of Liverpool, parts of London and Glasgow. People risk being left with no money at Christmas. If the Prime Minister won't halt... If the Prime Minister won't halt the rollout of universal credit, will she at least immediately, immediately end the five-week wait? Exactly. Prime Minister! Can I say to the Right Honourable Gentleman that he doesn't quite seem to understand how the system actually operates? No one, no one has to wait for money if they need it. We've made advances... Uh, we're less than a third of the way through and already there's too much noise on both sides of the House. Members must calm themselves. The questions will be heard, however long it takes, and the same is true of the replies. Please try to get used to that. The Prime Minister. No one needs to wait for their money if they need it. We have made it easier for people to get advances. We've ensured they can get 100%, 100% of their first month's payment up front. And we've already, and we've already scrapped the seven-day waiting period. And as I repeat, what happened when we scrapped the seven-day waiting period? Labour voted against it. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker. It's a loan that's offered for some people. And the Trussell Trust has pointed out that food banks... The Trussell Trust has also pointed out that food banks face record demand this December. I just gently say to her and the members behind her, food banks are not just a photo opportunity for Conservative MPs. Who themselves... All of whom supported, all of whom supported the cuts in benefit that have led to the poverty in this country. Yeah. Yesterday, the Joseph Roundry Foundation research found, and I quote, in work poverty was rising faster than the overall employment rate yeah. due to chronic low pay and insecure work. The United Kingdom has the weak weakest wage growth of all G20 nations. Living standards have fallen for the majority of people. What is so wrong with our economy that our pay growth is so much worse than each of the other nations in the G20? Prime Minister. Right, honourable gentlemen, that we, have, we now see wages growing faster than they have for nearly a decade. We see employment... We see employment at record levels. But what the Right Honourable Gentleman wants to do, he talks about scrapping universal credit. What he wants to do is to go back to square one. That means going back to a system that left 1.4 million people spending more, most of a decade trapped on benefits. It left people, it left people paying an effective tax rate of 90%. And it cost every household an extra £3,000 a year. As ever with Labour, it was ordinary working people who paid the price. Mr Speaker, the Chief Economist of the Bank of England describes the last decade as a lost decade for wages. And... Well, the Prime Minister might laugh at this. It's the reality of people's lives. It's the reality. Order, 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 order. I appeal to members making too much noise to stop doing so. And I order. And I say very gently to 
the junior minister on the back bench who is making far too much noise, but he's ordinarily a good-natured and genial chap. I'm referring to the Honourable Gentleman, the member for Hexham. You can do... Mr Opperman, you can do... Order! You can do so much better. Try to be a well-behaved citizen today. Well, possibly like some others, but, <laughs> but there are quite a lot of badly behaved people. Try to set a better example, Mr Opperman. You're a Minister of the Crown. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Two years ago, a United Nations committee found this government's policies towards disabled people represented a grave and systematic violation of their rights. Does the Prime Minister think that situation has improved in the past two years? Prime Minister. I say to the right honourable gentleman, first of all, in answer to the, the uh, latter point that he's made, it's this government that has a key commitment in relation to getting disabled, helping disabled people get into the workplace. There are too many disabled people who have felt that they have not been able to do what they want to do, of actually getting into the workplace, earning an income for themselves and their families. And it's this government that is helping. And the former Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, uh, uh, through the... the uh, arrangements that she put in place to ensure the disability confident arrangements that she put in place are doing exactly that. But he started off his, he started off his comments by talking, referencing the last decade. Yes, the last decade have meant that difficult decisions have had to be taken. But why did those difficult decisions have to be taken? They were taken, they were taken because of the Labour Party's mismanagement of the economy. Remember, remember the letter from the Right Honourable Member for Birmingham Hodge Hill. Under Labour, there is no money left. Mr Speaker, when I hear a Prime Minister talking about difficult decisions, what always happens afterwards in these contexts is the the poorest lose out in our society. 4.3 million disabled people are now in poverty. 50,000 were hit by appalling cuts to the Employment Support Allowance benefit alone last year. This government labelled disabled people scroungers. It called those unable to work skivers. It created... Order, 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 Carl, order. I don't need any advice from the Home Secretary. He should seek to discharge his own obligations in his office to the best of his ability. I require no advice from the Right Honourable Gentleman on the discharge of mine. Be clear about that. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. This government also created a hostile environment. Mr Speaker, this, ho- this government created a hostile environment for the Windrush generation. When the UN rapporteur said British compassion for those who are suffering has been replaced by a punitive, mean-spirited and callous approach, he couldn't have summed up this contemptible government any better. Yeah. Child poverty is rising. Homelessness rising, destitution rising, household debt rising. When will the Prime Minister turn her warm words into action, end the benefit freeze, repeal the bedroom tax, scrap the two child cap, and halt the rollout of universal credit? Prime Minister! The, the right honourable gentleman referred to the poorest losing out. I'll tell him when the poorest lose out. It's when a Labour government comes in. It's a, it's a order, order, order. The finger pointing and yelling and braying must stop. I understand that passions are running highly, but on both sides of the House, we need to have some sense of decorum. The Prime Minister. It's when a Labour government comes in. What this government has done, we've introduced the national living wage. Conservatives, not Labour. We've taken, we've taken millions of people out of paying tax altogether. Conservatives, not Labour. 
Under this government, 3.3 million jobs have been created. Every Labour government leaves office with unemployment higher than when it went into office. So what do we see under this government? Our economy is growing, employment is rising, investment is up. We're giving the NHS the biggest single cash boost in its history. Taxes are being cut. Wages are rising. Labour would destroy all that. It's this Conservative government that's building a brighter future for our country. Mr Speaker, as my right hon. Friend knows, none of us look forward to a smear test, but it can make the difference between life and death. Worryingly, nearly a third of women are missing out on cervical screening. Can I ask my right hon. Friend what steps she and her government are taking to make sure more women get tested and don't suffer the terrible consequences of picking up cancer too yeah, late? Yeah. Well, can I Prime Minister. My friend, I'm grateful to her for raising what is an important point. And we do need to recognise that we need to do more to encourage women to undertake cervical screening tests. Uh, in October, we announced a package of measures which will be rolled out across the country, which has the aim of uh, seeing three quarters of all cancers detected at an early stage by 2028. And this will see radically, uh, a radical overhaul of the screening programmes, and it will be made more accessible and easier to use. But I just want to give this very simple message, and I am able to do this standing at this dispatch box. Smear tests are not nice. All those of us who have had smear tests recognise they are not nice. But they are important. They, if you want to see cancer detected early, have your smear test. A few minutes of discomfort could be saving your life. Yeah. Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank you for your remarks of welcome to Sammy Woodhouse, a very brave woman who has done the right thing in waving her anonymity. We must all call out crimes of sexual violence, those responsible must be held to account. Mr Speaker, we were promised strong and stable. What we have is a government in crisis, a government that has lost two Brexit secretaries, a Home Secretary, a Foreign Secretary, a Work and Pension Secretary, a government that has suffered from three consecutive defeats in just two hours. The first government to do so, Mr Speaker, in 40 years. And now a government found to be in contempt to Parliament. Is it time that the Prime Minister took responsibility, a responsibility for concealing the facts on her Brexit deal from members in this House and the public? Will she take responsibility? Prime Minister. He is absolutely wrong about that. We have not concealed the facts on the Brexit deal from members of this House. What he will see is that the legal position that was set out on Monday in the 34 page document, together with the statement made and the answers to questions given by the Attorney General on Monday, very clearly set out the legal position. Ian Blackford. Mr. Speaker, that is an incredibly disappointing response from the Prime Minister. The facts have had to be dragged out of this government by Parliament. Mr Speaker, this morning we have seen the detail of the illegal advice. We have seen the facts that the government tried to hide. Mr Speaker, this government is giving Northern Ireland permanent membership of the single market and the customs union. The legal advice is clear. It states, despite statements in the protocol that is not intended to be permanent, in international law, the protocol would endure indefinitely. Since the Prime Minister returned from Brussels with her deal, the Prime Minister has been misleading the House inadvertently or otherwise. The Prime Minister must explain... Order! 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 There can be no suggestion of otherwise. The right honourable gentleman must make it clear that there is no suggestion that the government is dislead, misleading the House deliberately. There can be no question of that. If the right honourable gentleman wants to use the word inadvertently, which people do now and again, he can, but there must be no ambiguity on the point. And I ask the right honourable gentleman to clarify that matter and to order, order. No, no, I don't need any advice from anyone. I know exactly what I'm doing, and the right honourable gentleman must comply. Mr Ian Blackford. 
Mr Speaker, I did use the word inadvertently, and I repeat it, that since the Prime Minister has returned from Brussels with her deal, the Prime Minister has been misleading the House, perhaps inadvertently. The Prime Minister... The Prime Minister... Order. 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 I always want the Right Honourable Gentleman to be heard fully, and he will be. But there can be no imputation of dishonour, and the insertion of the word perhaps suggests the Right Honourable Gentleman wants to keep his options open. The option of imputing dishonour does not exist. That word must now be removed. Please rephrase, continue, and complete briefly. Mr. Ian Blackford. Mr. Speaker, I, I say again inadvertently. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister must explain. The Prime Minister must explain why she continues to deny Scotland the rights and opportunities that her deal offers to other parts of the United Kingdom. Yeah. Minister, I say to the right honourable gentleman that I think what he will see if he makes a careful analysis of the statement that the Attorney General made and his answer to questions on Monday and of the legal position that was set out by the Government, uh, in many ways unprecedented that the Government actually published such a 34-page document, he will see, he will see that the advice, the advice that he is holding in his left hand has no difference from the uh, statement that was given. Indeed, indeed, I might take up the personal challenge from the Right Honourable Gentleman. I have myself said on the floor of this House that there is indeed no unilateral right to pull out of the backstop. What I have also said is it is not the intention of either party that the backstop should A, be used in the first place, or should B, if it is used, should be anything other than temporary. And he, find, he finishes off by saying once again that he wants to, uh, wants to look to what Scotland should have from the deal. We are leaving the European Union as the whole United Kingdom. We will negotiate as the whole United Kingdom for the interests of Scotland for the interests of Scotland, remaining in the internal market of the United Kingdom is the most important economic interest. And for the interest of Scotland coming out of the common fisheries policy, which is in our deal and our policy and not his. Gordon Henderson. Uh, Mr Speaker, my local authority, Swale Borough Council, is being asked to find land for thousands more homes. And my constituents in City Mall and Sheppey are not happy. Over the past 20 years, we've seen large-scale housing developments that have transformed our area. We feel we have already accepted more than our fair share of new housing. So will my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, urge her ministers to take steps to reduce the housing targets being imposed on Swale? A minister. Can I say to my honourable friend, I, I absolutely recognise uh, the concern that he raises and the fact that often people are concerned when they see proposals for new development in their areas. But we do need to build the homes that the country needs so that everyone can afford a decent, safe place, uh, safe place to call their own. And we need to help more people onto the housing ladder. There are young people today who worry that they will not be able to get onto the housing ladder. And I'm sure my honourable friend shares my determination to ensure that they are able to do so. And I'm pleased to say that in the last year, we've delivered over 222,000 new homes, the highest level we've seen in all but one of the last 31 years. But I'm sure that my right honourable friend, the Community Secretary, would be happy to meet with my honourable friend to discuss his local issue uh, further. Stuart Hosey. Yeah. 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 Every single Brexit scenario this government have modelled it shows GDP growth to fall, yeah. and to fall further when the impact of ending freedom of movement yeah. is yeah. factored yeah. in. Yeah. This Prime Minister continues to pretend ending free movement is a good thing. It is a bad thing. Yeah. So let me ask her, why is she prepared to take from our children and grandchildren the ability to travel freely throughout Europe, and why is she doing it in a way which is economically illiterate? Yeah. Prime Minister... 
what, uh, what the analysis actually shows is that outside of the European Union, the best deal available in relation to our economy, which delivers on leaving the European Union, is the deal that is on the table, is the deal that I have negotiated with the European Union. When people, voted, when people voted to leave the European Union, one of the issues they voted on was bringing an end to free movement once and for all. And that is what this Government will deliver. Alex Chalk! Yeah. In its November survey, local homelessness charity P3 recorded that there were two rough sleepers in Cheltenham. Two too many, of course, but a dramatic reduction on the previous year. Does my right honourable friend agree that this shows the value of social impact bonds which provide vital one-on-one support to people with complex needs? And will she su- support and congratulate the vital work of charities CCP and P3 who make such a difference to vulnerable people in our community? Yeah. Prime Minister! Uh, can I say to my honourable friend that he raises a very important issue, and yet we are all concerned about the question of rough sleepers. But as he says, it's about finding the solutions and the ways through that is important. And I'd like to commend him for the excellent work he's been doing and campaigning on these issues on homelessness, rough sleeping and social impact bonds. And I'd like to congratulate P3 and CCP in Cheltenham. I think the rough sleeping social impact bond, which is designed to support individuals who have spent a long time within the homelessness system and to reduce rough sleeping in the long term by helping them to access the support and services they need, is a very important step forward. And I congratulate those organisations for the work they have done in his constituency. Kevin Brennan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Point six of the Attorney's legal advice shows that the Prime Minister has not only breached her red lines on the single market but also on customs. Doesn't it mean it's even less likely that her deal will pass through this House? Constitutionally, that should mean a general election. But if not, isn't the way to resolve this to have a public vote on her deal? Why can't she see that and why can't she say that? Prime Minister! Can I say, if the, the right honourable general looks at the arrangements that we have uh, in place for the future relationship between the United Kingdom and the European Union, it is clear that we will not be in the single market and we will not be in the customs union. What we will have, what we will have is an ambitious trade agreement which enables us to uh, reduce those, and and we will continue to uh, work for frictionless trade at the border. It is an ambitious trade agreement, unlike any other that has been given to any other advanced economy. It is the most ambitious trade agreement that any advanced economy has with the European Union. That is good for this country and it is good for jobs in his constituency. This is Pauline Latham. All young people have to stay in educational training until they are 18 now. Isn't it time we raised the age of marriage in this country from 16 to 18, as we ask other countries to do? Prime Minister. Honourable friend, I think the numbers of people who are marrying in England and Wales at 16 or 17 are very small and actually continue to decline. Uh, We have not seen any evidence of failings in the existing protections for people to marry in England and Wales at 16 or 18 with the appropriate consents, but we do continue to keep this under review. And my noble, my noble friend, the Baroness Williams, said uh, back in September that we will look at whether there is any link between parents giving consent when girls are aged 16 or 17 and instances of forced marriage, if that is one of the concerns, that, that may be one of the concerns behind uh, the point that my honourable friend is making. So we will specifically look at that issue. McGovern. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In March 2017, the Prime Minister knows that New Ferry in my constituency was devastated by a huge explosion and many people injured. I raised this with her at Prime Minister's Questions. And Mr Speaker, she said that the community would get support to recover. After 18 months of struggling, her Secretary of State has now written to me to say that New Ferry will get no such support from her government. So was I wrong, Mr Speaker, to take her at her word? Or were my constituents right when they said, when it comes to helping people, you can never trust the Tories? Prime Minister... I say to the Honourable Lady, I think she knows, she knows of incidents when people have been able in her region to trust the Tories. And she knows what... Let's look at the explosion in New Ferry. Let's look at the explosion in New Ferry. It was clearly devastating. 
It clearly impacted both residents and businesses, and I did, as she said, made a commitment to look at it. Now, I will look at the uh, letter that she has received from the Secretary of State, because my understanding was that the MHCLG, the Ministry, was encouraging Wirral Council to apply for a range of funding streams, yeah. Yeah. including uh, uh, various sums of money that would have been available, and that they had asked Homes England to work with the Council and had made on their regeneration plans and had made money available in response response to that, but I will certainly look at the letter she refers to. Charles Walker. Mr Speaker, I do rise from the naughty corner, so I might need your protection. Uh, Mr Speaker, can I thank my right honourable friend for her determined campaigning in the area of mental health, both as Home Secretary and now as Prime Minister? And will she join me in congratulating Sir Simon Wesley, who has just done a review of the Mental Health Act? His findings will be published tomorrow. Sir Simon conducted this review with great good humour, great good humour, with compassion and dignity. And even though this House is so divided on so many issues, it should be united on this report. Prime Minister. I say to my honourable friend, I think he's absolutely right. I hope that this issue of mental health and how we look at the Mental Health Act is an important question that will unite people across this House with a recognition that we have been right to have this review. And I certainly, uh, I'm certainly happy to congratulate Professor Sir Simon Wesley on the work that he's done. He's engaged with a wide range and a large number of service users and their families, as well as health organisations and professionals, to help shape his recommendations. I certainly look forward to reading them, and we will. Bring, obviously commit as a government to come forward with uh, legislation in due course. This is an important area. We should all get behind this because we need to ensure that we are delivering for those people in our country who do suffer from mental health problems. Jamie Stone. Mr Speaker, as the Dunray nuclear site in my constituency continues to decommission, the issue of high quality replacement jobs is hugely important. In fact, it's crucial. Therefore, I welcome Her Majesty's Government's decision to locate the UK's first vertical takeoff rocket launch site in the north of my constituency. I give credit where it is due, Mr. Mr. Speaker. Will the Prime Minister ensure that the maximum number of jobs arising from this site will be located locally in North Sutherland and Caithness and not somewhere much further south? Can I say to the Honourable Gentleman, I thank him for his remarks about the Government's decision. Uh, This is an exciting opportunity for the United Kingdom to be taking a leading role in the new commercial space age. And uh, obviously he's referenced the new spaceport and and the ambition that we have there. I think I I understand that following a positive report by the local Crofters Association, Highlands and Islands Enterprise is moving ahead with their plans, which could create 40 skilled jobs locally in spaceport construction and operation. And uh, I I recognise the uh, importance of the skilled jobs that he's talking about locally. I think this is a real opportunity for his constituency, but it's also an opportunity for the UK to be at the leading edge of this technology. Sir William Cash. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, The motion that was passed yesterday relating to the Attorney General uh, related to the whole of the agreement, not just to the question to which the uh, letter which we've now had published relates, which is exclusively the protocol on Ireland and Northern Ireland. Uh, Mr Speaker, surely, given the fact that uh, under the Ministerial Code it states the law officers must be consulted in good time before the Government is committed to critical decisions involving legal considerations, and the Attorney General states that the international agreement is binding on the United Kingdom and the EU, Why is it that we have not had an opinion on matters such as the control over laws, ECJ jurisdiction, the incompatibility of the uh, agreement with the repeal of the 72 Act, and matters of seminal importance to deciding this question? Prime Minister. To the the Honourable Gentleman, uh, I suggest he looks at the remarks that were made uh, in this chamber yesterday following the Government's announcement that it would indeed be publishing uh, this uh, final advice that was given by the Attorney General, which was asked for. Uh, He has referred once again to the issue of the repeal of the 1972 European Communities Act. As I have answered him, I think, on more than one occasion in this chamber and in the Liaison Committee, it was always clear when the EU Withdrawal Act went through, which indeed did repeal the 1972 European Communities Act and bring the EU law, uh, a key the EU law into UK law, 
that in the, in the uh, uh, occasion that there would be an implementation period in which we were operating much as the same as we are today as a member of the European Union, then it would be necessary to ensure that the, uh, ne any necessary changes were made, and those changes would be made in the withdrawal agreement bill, which will be brought before Parliament. Mrs Sharon Hodgson. Yes. Thank you, Mr yes. Speaker. The Prime Minister may recall that last week I asked her about the terrible funding settlement for Tyne and Weir Fire and Rescue Service. Well, I was not happy with the answer, so I'm <laughs> going to try again. In light of the fact that, the funding, that funding local services, such as police and fire, through the council tax precept, just doesn't work in areas such as mine, yeah. Yeah. will she right. look again at this funding <coughs> formula that is going to leave areas such as mine perilously close to being an unsafe service in fire and police yeah. very soon? Yeah. 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 Well, I, understand, I understand that in Home Office Orals earlier this week, the Police and Fire Minister uh, undertook to get back to the Honourable Lady, but, I might, uh, uh, but as I think my right honourable friend, the Fire Minister, made clear this week, the authorities' core spending power has increased this year. I am also informed that Tyne and Weir hold £25 million of reserves, which is equivalent to 52% of their core spending power. Ah. Trudy Harrison. Yeah. Action, despite the Transport Secretary's assurance that the guards on the Cumbrian Coastal Line will remain. Will my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, condemn the actions of RMT, which have left vulnerable people without public transport yeah, 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 and yeah, businesses yeah. suffering yeah, in the run up to Christmas? Yeah, 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 yeah. What can I say to my honourable friend that I do indeed? Uh, condemn the action that has been taken by RMT, which, as she says, is leading to people and businesses <coughs> suffering as a result. And we're calling on RMT to end these strikes. They've been guaranteed jobs beyond this franchise. There is no need, there is no reason to continue this needless action. And the message is very clear stop the strikes, get round the table, and put passengers first. Julie Cooper. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Ofsted report that 1.3 million children with special educational needs are not getting those needs yeah, met in school, not. and over 2,000 of children on EHC plans in 2018 received no support yeah. whatsoever. Yeah. Yeah. Ambitious, right. ambitious, yeah. ambitious for Autism report that there's been an increase of 60% over the last four years in yeah. autistic children being excluded from school. Yeah. Today, can I ask the Prime Minister to look, please look beyond those figures, to the children and affected yeah. and the distress that they and their parents are experiencing yeah. and would she agree with me that this is a national scandal that needs to be addressed with the utmost urgency yeah. Yeah. Can I say to the Honourable Lady every child, every child deserves the right education every child deserves the right education for them and we are working up to drive up the quality for children with special educational needs and those with disabilities as well and we've taken a number of steps we've introduced a new inspections framework more focused on local area strengths and weaknesses, and we're working to spread best practice. There are some areas where this is dealt with in a better way than in others. And when used properly, the health, education, health and care plans do ensure support is tailored to the needs of children, and families are put at the heart of the, pro of the process, and more money is going in this year towards children with special education needs. But I recognise I recognise that often there are parents of children with special educational needs who feel that they are constantly having to you know, beat their head against the, the bureaucracy that they come up with in order to ensure that they get the right support for their children. We are committed to ensuring that we are delivering for children and we are delivering for quality education that is right for children with special educational needs. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I know how much the Prime Minister likes to get out on the doorsteps of her constituency every time she's able to, as I do. Does she, like me, find that people are raising with her the issue of potholes on a regular basis? Yes. And does she, like me, welcome the fact that we are spending £6.7 million? Pounds? Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, it happens in my constituency as well. I want to hear about the pothole situation. <laughs> no. In Redditch and elsewhere, absolutely. Uh, Rachel McLean. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The roads in Redditch are excellent on the whole, but we are very pleased to be awarded £6.7 million worth of funding across Worcestershire in the recent budget. How quickly does the Prime Minister think this money will be spent fixing our roads? Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister! 
Can I say to my honourable friend, she does indeed raise an important issue. Potholes and local services and uh, issues that matter on pe- for people on a day-to-day basis are those that are raised on the doorstep. And my understanding is that the money is available and it should be being spent now. Joanna Cherry. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In the Scottish case, which has established that Article 50 or the Prime Minister's Article 50 notice can indeed be revoked, the UK Government has lost three times in the Supreme Court of Scotland, in the UK Supreme Court, and yesterday in the Advocate General's opinion in the Court of Justice of the European Union. Can the Prime Minister tell us why she has put so much public money and so much energy? into depriving this Parliament of legal certainty about the options which will be open to it when her deal is voted down next week. Can I I say to the Honourable Lady that this uh, this is an issue on which both the UK Government and actually the European Commission felt that it was right that this issue be tested. Uh, We will not revoke Article 50. That is, that is, that is... That is clear. The Government will not revoke Article 50. And I think everybody in this House needs to understand what the judgment of the Advocate General, which, if past experience is anything to go by, the Court will uh, uh, you know, go with, uh, but it still hasn't come to its final decision. But if the advice of the Advocate General is, uh, if his determination is, does go ahead, what it says is that it is possible for a country unilaterally to revoke Article 50. But that isn't about extending Article 50. It's about making sure that we don't leave the European Union. That's what, that's what that judgment is about. We will not revoke Article 50. The British people voted to leave the European Union, and we will be leaving. All scully. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A number of members of this House and members of the public are still concerned that we may risk being in an extended, if not permanent, backstop situation or customs territory. Can my right honourable friend explain why, in her opinion, the European Union won't want this to exist and that they they will negotiate in good faith for an extensive free trade agreement? Minister. My honourable friend is absolutely right. I recognise there are concerns about the backstop. But it is indeed the case that it is not attractive for the European Union to have the United Kingdom in the backstop uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, because in that backstop we will be making no financial obligation to the European Union. We will not be accepting free movement. Uh, at the, and therefore, and there will be very light touch level playing field requirements. These are matters which mean that the European Union does not see this as an, uh, as an, attractive, uh, as an attractive place for them to put the UK. They think that's an attractive place for the UK to be in, and they won't want us to be in it for any longer than is necessary. Patricia Gibson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The European Structural Fund is worth billions to Scotland and funds initiatives in my constituency of North Ayrshire and Arran, such as tackling (coughs) poverty and promoting social inclusion. This is to be replaced by the UK Shared Prosperity Fund. However, we have no real detail or clarity as to how this fund will be designed or when it will begin. Why not? It is Prime Minister. Place by a shared prosperity fund, which will be looking at ensuring that we are dealing with disparities which exist uh, between communities and between nations, and the government will be consulting before the end of the year. And Derek Thomas. Hey. Mr. Speaker. Hey. Next week will be the first opportunity for MPs to vote on the withdrawal agreement, and I was glad to have the opportunity to speak to the debate last night. Should the withdrawal agreement not secure the support of Parliament, can my friend the Prime Minister assure this House and my constituents that Her Majesty's Government will seek early dialogue with negotiators in Brussels to seek to address the genuine concerns of MPs across the House? Prime Minister. My honourable friend, I I believe that the deal we have negotiated is a good deal. I recognise that concerns have been raised, particularly around the backstop, and that is an issue which, as I said yesterday in uh, in my speech in the debate, I am continuing to listen to colleagues on that uh, and considering the way forward. And Nick Smith. Mr Speaker, one of my constituents has lost thousands of pounds from his British Steel pension as he was preyed upon by a rogue financial advisor. It's happened to hundreds of others across the country. The Financial Conduct Authority doesn't have the teeth to sort this out. I think ripping off pensioners is criminal. Does the Prime Minister agree? 
Prime Minister. Can I say to the honourable gentleman that I'm very sorry to hear of the case of his constituent in relation to his uh, to his pension and the uh, the actions of that financial advisor, uh, and I will ensure that the Treasury uh, look at this issue of the Financial Conduct Authority in these sorts of cases. Vicky Ford. Yes. Yes. Speaker, our country's children are our country's future, and yesterday Ofsted reported that 95 per cent of early years providers are now ranked good or outstanding, up from 74 per cent six years ago. So will the Prime Minister join me in thanking all those who work in early years organisations for giving our children the very best start in their lives. Prime Minister. I, I absolutely agree with my honourable friend that the early years education is important. It's it, uh, important for children to give them that good start in life. I think it is a matter to be welcomed and, and applauded. The fact that we now have 95% of those providers uh, ranked of uh, uh, children in uh, good or outstanding provision of early years, and we should thank all those who are working in early years provision for the excellent work they are doing for our children and their future. Gregory Campbell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This morning's legal advice refers to the backstop as permanent arrangement and will endure indefinitely, a repeat of previous assertions that were made. Does the Prime Minister agree at this last moment that the entire premise of the backstop has been based on a false assertion? It is a practical physical, political impossibility under any circumstances for a hard border to emerge on the island of Ireland. Why has she allowed that to be used as a negotiating ploy by the EU against the United Kingdom? Prime Minister. Gentlemen, this is not a negotiating ploy by the European Union against the UK. What it is, is our commitment as a UK government to the people of Northern Ireland. He says that the political assertion that there will be no hard border is sufficient to give people reassurance for the future. I say no. What people want to know is that arrangements will be in place. It doesn't have to be the backstop. The future relationship will deal deal with this. The extension of the implementation period could deal with the temporary period. Alternative arrangements could deal with it. But people need to know. People need to know. It is beyond a political assertion that there is that commitment there to the people of Northern Ireland to ensure that we have no hard border. Mr Speaker, uh, yesterday London students heard from the renowned Holocaust survivor Hannah Lewis. She described the horrors of Europe's darkest hour. And as we celebrate the festival of Hanukkah, does my right honourable friend agree with me? There could be no better place for the National Holocaust Memorial and Learning Centre that alongside this Palace of Westminster as a permanent memorial to the horrors of the ultimate of anti-Semitism. Prime Minister. Can I I, uh, commend Hannah for the uh, contribution that she is making and has made over the years in bringing to home to people the absolute horrors of the Holocaust. Can I commend the work of the Holocaust Education Trust, which I think does important work up and down our country. But I absolutely agree with my honourable friend. I think there is no better place for the Holocaust Memorial and Learning Centre to be than right next to our Parliament. And what is important is that this is not just a memorial. It is a learning centre. It will be about educating young people and others about the horrors of man's inhumanity to man. Liz Savile Roberts. I would like to take the opportunity to express my respect to Sammy Woodhouse for her courage as well. Yesterday, the National Assembly of Wales became the first Parliament on the British Isles to reject the Prime Minister's deal. What's clear, Mr Speaker, is it won't be the last. Wales has seen through how she is intent on inflicting GBH, her government's Brexit harm, on our nation. Beset on all sides, will the Prime Minister come to her senses and rule out a no-deal scenario before this House forces her to do so? If the Honourable Lady is concerned about the possible effects of a no-deal scenario, the only way to ensure that there is not a no-deal scenario is to accept a deal scenario and accept the deal that's on the table. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Prime Minister, the legal witch hunting of military veterans, which is something I've been raising with you, I think, for around a year now, is getting worse. The latest victim is David Griffin, a 77-year-old former Royal Marine,
who is being reinvestigated for an incident that took place in Northern Ireland 45 years ago and for which he was thoroughly cleared at the Times. Yeah. And they knew where to find him, Prime Minister, because he is an in pensioner at the Royal Hospital in Chelsea. How is it we live in a country where alleged IRA terrorists are given letters of comfort and we go after Chelsea pensioners yeah. instead. Yeah. Prime Minister, this nonsense must stop. Yeah. Please, please do something about it. Yeah. Can I say to my right honourable friend, obviously he raises uh, a particular case which will have touched everybody across this, uh, across this House. But he also raises the contrast of the treatment of veterans with, the, uh, with terrorists. Uh, the, uh, Around 3,500 people were killed in the Troubles. 90% of those were murdered by terrorists. And many of these cases require further investigations, including actually the deaths of hundreds of members of the security forces. What we have done is committed to establishing new mechanisms for dealing with this in a balanced and proportionate way. We are concerned that what we see at the moment is a situation where there has been, I believe, a disproportionate uh, emphasis on those who are either serving military or indeed police officers at the time. I want to ensure that the terrorists are investigated and I, we continue to look at this question. We have consulted on it. We will be responding to that cons consultation. I recognise the strength of feeling in, from my hon right honourable friend and others in relation to this issue and the Government will be responding in due course. Thank you. Finally, Louise Haig. Thank you very much, yeah. Mr Speaker. Yeah. I know the whole House is inspired by the bravery of Sammy Woodhouse in speaking out so that we can drive real change and horrified by the news that the man who raped Sammy and is serving a 35-year prison sentence was encouraged to seek access to her child through the family courts. Does the Prime Minister agree that no man who has fathered a child through rape should have parental rights? Yes. And will she seek to amend the legislation yes. through the Courts and Tribunal Bill when it comes back to this House yes. so that men who have fathered children through rape cannot weaponise the courts yes. to access children yes. and re-traumatise their victims all over yeah. again? Yeah. Well, this is, this is obviously a very distressing case, and I'm sure, as, as has just been heard, the concerns of the whole House rest with Sammy Woodhouse and rest with, with, with what has happened in this case. And as the facts have been reported, I'm sure we all of us consider it absolutely extraordinary that this should have happened in the first place. What is important is that the Ministry of Justice and other departments are urgently looking and working with local authorities on the issues that are raised in this case to ensure that there is a process in, in place in future that does protect children and, mother, and the child and mothers from, from harm. I understand the Honourable Lady has met my my hon. Friend, the Parliamentary Under Secretary at the Minister of Justice, and I would urge her to continue engaging with the Ministry of Justice on this very important issue. Thank you. Order. <laughs> we will come to the Right Hon. Lady and her point of order ere long, but I think that she should have an attentive audience. An attentive audience, and that might not be possible if there's too much noise. So we'll just give it a moment, and then we'll hear the Right Hon. Lady. Thank you, Mark. Point of order, Anna Subri. Is it in order that when you quite properly point out uh, a member, 